Welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. Um, we have over five hours requested of oral argument time, so only ask for the time that you need, not the time that you want. We're familiar with the briefs and the records, and if we have more questions, we will keep asking them. People versus Victor Mateo. Appellant? Okay, that is submitted. Gropstein versus Gropstein versus Bellinson Law. Appellant? Appellant, Your Honor, uh, seven and three, please. Respondent? Uh, Six, one, and five. Uh, J. Kimberly versus Benjamin G. is submitted. Kurt versus Carreras. Appellant? Three, one, and five. Uh, De Souza versus Ortiz Osorio, appellant. Appellant again. I have four. I'm sorry, what? Appellant again. Okay. I have four and one for the uh, Respondent? Four, one, and five. 20 Broad Street versus Sonder USA, appellant. Uh, respondent? Uh, six, two, and six. And again, if we have more questions, we'll keep asking them. Uh, Simper Tiji versus Carlisle House, appellant. Good afternoon, appellant, five and one. Is respondent here? No, do you wish to submit? Your call whether you wish to submit or you want a little time. What? Okay, submitted. Uh, Klein versus Grodin, appellant. Uh, submitted. People versus Rodriguez, submitted. No one wanted to come today. We're such a scary bench. <laughs> Uh, U.S. Bank versus Noreen, Appel oh, appellant in time. Respondent? Three minutes. Uh, Hilton Wiener versus Zenk, appellant? Appellant five minutes, please, Your Honor. Uh, there's no respondent. Do you wish to submit or do you wish to argue? Uh, just take, I'll probably do less than five minutes, Your Honor. I'll give you three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Karras versus George Comfort and Sons, appellant? Appellant, seven, three. Uh, respondent? Uh, six, one, and five. Diamond Realty versus Jacob Gold. Respondent? Uh, six, one, and five. People versus Adams. Appellant? Respondent? Three, one, and three. And Espinosa versus Motor Vehicle is submitted. Uh, so the first case on for argument is Gopstein versus Bellison Law. Good afternoon. May it please the court. Sheldon Gopstein, uh, the plaintiff appellant, uh, pro se. Uh, I first, just as a preliminary matter, want to say that it, it, it brings me no joy to accuse two attorneys of malpractice, back to back, no less. But that is precisely what happened. That is, that is just, those are just the facts. Unfortunately, the court below uh, dismissed the complaint and I would just want to quickly mention uh, the, the, the salient points as to why the complaint should not have been dismissed. Um, the court below mentions um, 3211A1. Um, it was dismissed under that, on, on that subsection. Um, I'll just quote from the defendant's brief. The, uh, in order to dismiss a case under 3211A1, you have to have 
uh, documentary evidence that council, utterly- Council, council decided on that, uh, council. Okay. okay. Go ahead. I think we have the same point, so you yeah, can the go court ahead. Yeah, the court didn't decide on that. The court decided it on failure to state a cause of action, so we don't really need to spend any time on the documentary evidence, because although the court stated it, it yeah. never analyzed it or dismissed it on that ground. Correct, Your Honor. The reason I bring it up, and I won't uh, belabor the point, is that if the case is only dismissed under 3211A7, which I will get to right now, which I don't believe would be appropriate either, then I would be able to replead or reserve. It's not on the merits. 3211A7 is not on the well, merits. Well, sometimes it's on the merits. If the court finds you okay. fail to state a cause of action and based on what you articulated, you can state a cause of action, then that's the end. In many that cases, that get would... dismissed with prejudice on a failure to state a cause of action particularly in uh, malpractice cases against attorneys because the standard is high for what you have to prove. Yes. You have to show that but for the negligence you would have been successful. And I'm not sure how right. you would meet that standard in this case since as the court below found there's an argument that any damages you're claiming are quite speculative. Well, so Maybe you want to address that. Yeah, I, will, I would love to address that. Your Honor, the, the 3211A7 uh, aspect of it the court said the complaint was inartfully drafted. Inartful drafting is not a ground for dismissal, and I don't no, believe it was. No, but the court, there's more than that behind okay. it, obviously. So why don't you address the claim that any damages you might possibly be able to assert are speculative and therefore not recoverable in a legal malpractice action? Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Damages are not speculative at, at, at all. The, I would have to prove not only that Mr. Bellinson committed malpractice, but that I would have, I would have prevailed in the underlying case and would have gotten more than the than this case settled for. Uh, to make a long story short, when, it, when an attorney who says that the subcontractor is responsible, he's primarily responsible for your injuries, he told me that. He said it in an email and it's in the record. He then does not oppose the motion. He does not give the court any grounds whatsoever as any, expl any, any explanation as to why that subcontractor should be found liable. What did they do wrong? What, what was the breach of the duty of care? Submit a memo of law, an expert affidavit, anything but a rambling attorney's affirmation where he misspells his own name. Frankly, Counsel, I, yeah. you, you, you raised, uh, you, you based your damages on a specific number. How did you reach that number? What, were, how did, what did you base your calculations on? Thank you, Your Honor. It was actually based upon Mr. Peppermint's estimate of what he thought the case was worth. I could have frankly simply said, I'm seeking damages in excess of all jurisdictional limits of the lower courts. I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's I, I've been sort of challenged in the, on the appeal here to, to, exp, you know, to substantiate the damages, but the 160 is the difference, to answer your quick question quickly. It's the difference between what Mr. Pepperman said the case was worth and what I ultimately settled it for. He said Bond Brothers is responsible for your injury. This is a five or $600,000 case. I settled it for virtually a fraction of that and Bond Brothers paid nothing or $5,000 I should say, I, or a, a minuscule amount of money. So what he's, what, so losing that subcontractor diminished the, the, the value of the case radically. Um, I don't think that's very difficult to prove. I'll just, I, I, obviously it, all, it remains to be proven, but that's not speculative. That's just evidence that needs to be pr produced either in opposition to a motion for summary judgment or a trial, but not on the, it's not dismissible on the pleadings, in my, in my opinion, Your Honor. Um, causation, the, the judge uh, below also um, criticized me for not saying the causation was speculative. I don't think there's any question but that I relied on Mr. Pep, uh, Mr. Bellinson's advice. He was conflicted, however. He wanted me to settle this case, not for my benefit. He's, he's saying, just get rid of it. It's, it's not worth your time, things of that nature. I find out later on, he's trying to curry favor with my adversary. He's basically trying to get Mr. Mr. getting me to withdraw a meritorious claim that could be worth 160,000, could be worth 260,000, depending on what I can prove, the, the, the value of the case diminished by losing that subcontractor. But he's interested in his own words, he says, the day after the settlement, uh, he says, I am, um, I'm a personal injury, I do trials, he's a personal injury attorney. And I'm like, what? But you have an obligation to me, I'm your client. 
This is not about you fishing for business after I settle a case. So wait a minute. Did he at all say, I am fishing for business? Other than saying, we both are lawyers, and, right. and the thing that lawyers do to each other is be collegial, did he say anything about asking him for business or the exact opposite? He, he said nothing before the settlement. Before the settlement, he gave me the impression I'm just he as, was, I don't, I'm yeah, not interested right. in your impression. I'm interested yeah. in the facts that you pled. Right. Other than we are both in the same, we are both lawyers in this field. Other than that, what facts did you play, plead that he had a conflict? The facts that I pled was, was that he, uh, he, he gave this effusive praise that immediately after I don't, I the mean, settlement. Let's, he said what he said. We're both in the same field. You're yeah. a damn good lawyer. Good for that. That's right, it. Right, That's right. all you've got. And then I challenged him the next day turn, during a phone call. I said, uh, Rob, what, what do you, you told me. And, Again, and, did but, he say to yeah. you, I expect to get business from this guy? Or He's, anything like he that? He said words to that effect. He absolutely, the answer is yes. I'll say Tell yes. Tell me what are the words. What did you plead? Yeah. He said, he's a personal injury lawyer. I do trials, I'm, meaning I'm going to try to get work from him. That's, that's what not, he said. That's, so he never said that. You, you, that's your... No, no, no. He's, those are exact words. Okay, that's counsel, great. how about the, in the record, how about in the record, the response from the other counsel saying, I do my own work. I don't refer anything out. I think I read that somewhere in the record. He didn't know that. Well, it doesn't matter what he knew or not, right? I mean, the, you have a problem there because even if he did, let's just say he didn't know that, he does ask, the other attorney is going to say, I don't refer stuff out. I mean, you got a problem, I think, at that point, don't you? Where the Here. counsel says, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, here's the bottom line. Here's the malpractice. It doesn't matter whether he ever gets a, 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 a referral or not. It was his motivation. He wasn't giving me honest advice. So wait, was, let me just, I just want to back up. He said to you, yes. he's a personal injury attorney, so am I. I'm going to try to get business from him. He didn't say, I'm going to try to get business from him. He said, it's <coughs> almost like, duh, he's a personal injury attorney. I do trials. That's why I'm trying to butter him up. And then I realized. But that's that, 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 that's, that third part right. of your statement. Yeah. What are you basing that on other than speculation? Because it's not for in the purpose, complaint, that's for sure. For it's, it, well, I'm not going to make up words that he, he said. He said, I asked him, why are you praising the person who you told me screwed up my case? Why are you doing this? And he said, it's because he's a personal injury attorney and I do trials. He's clearly trying to get business from him. The bottom line is the malpractice is the betrayal of his advice to me. I relied on his advice. He told me he was honestly giving me advice. You should withdraw this case. I, I got no benefit from it. Thank you. You have Pe time on rebuttal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is David Furman of uh, Furman, Kornfeld, and Brennan on behalf of uh, respondents Bellison Law. Uh, and Robert J. Bellison. Um, as the uh, court um, uh, seemed to pick up on, um, the plaintiff, um, the appellant, clearly relied on, on Bellison's, uh, attorney Bellison's advice, um, which should be encouraged for uh, a client to follow the advice of uh, their client, I mean, uh, their attorney. However, where plaintiff's complaint uh, seems to fall, fall off um, is the alleged link between these comments that attorney Bellison made and the um, <clears throat> uh, alleged conflict of interest uh, that, that, he's, that he's saying um, comes from these comments. Um, and as Your, your Honor uh, pointed to, that you can't get from the statements that uh, Attorney Balanson allegedly made, um, you can't get to uh, saying that he was motivated by um, a, a supposed conflict of interest without making grand assumptions of um, Attorney Bellison's motivation for simply complimenting uh, his adversary. Um, uh, f f the, the motion court was correct uh, in dismissing plaintiff's complaint for failure to state a claim because there, the, there was no facts to support the allegation that there was a, a conflict of interest. And, 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 and also, as uh, to point, um, the CPLR 3211A1, um, the documentary, documentary evidence, as um, uh, Your Honors pointed out, um, at page 174 to 175 in the record, um, 
appellant asks Attorney Pepperman, did, did Mr. Uh, Attorney Valenson ask the you for any referrals? The court decided on that anyway. The court decided I know, but on failure to state a cause of action, so. Uh, that, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. Um, I think if the, the, the bench doesn't have any further questions, I could rest on the, on the uh, papers of our submission. Thank you. Thank you, Your Judges, uh, Your Honor. The uh, counsel just, I mean, I, I made us made our jobs a lot easier. The causation issue is now admitted. He said there's no dispute that I relied on his advice. Thank goodness we don't have to discuss that anymore. That's part of the reason why this case was dismissed. They said that I, um, the judge below said I dis, I alleged causation in conclusory and an inartful way. It's now been conceded that I relied on his advice. It's an issue of fact. It's a question of fact as to whether he was giving me advice honestly or was, it, was he doing it because he was trying to curry favor with my adversary? That's an issue of fact. That can't be dismissed, in my opinion, respectfully, on a, on a motion to dismiss on the pleadings. That's clearly an issue of fact. I think I've stated enough as to what he said afterwards that would lend us, give us pause. Let me ask you one, one yeah. question. Didn't you um, help negotiate and write the releases for the underlying claim? Didn't, well, did not help. I didn't have any personal, uh, uh, any direct com communication with Mr. Pepper whatsoever. The, the negotiation was done entirely. I'm out, did you draft the documents that settled the case? Y it, was, it was a release. So I didn't now you're that. saying, yeah. after you drafted and signed a document and a release, you're saying that there was malpractice? A hundred percent. Okay. It's the motivation for the, for, it's the advice that was, that was flawed. Mm -hmm. Thank and it, you. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you. Hurt versus Carreras. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Greg Friedman for Appellant. I don't think there's too much to say here. I'll just start with this. I think the big problem that defendants faced when they moved for summary judgment is causation. Their IME doctor, Dr. Roth, he basically said there was no causation based on the MRIs or MRI reports. I don't really know which it was based on his expert Counsel, report. Assuming that um, the defendants met their burden for summary judgment, your submissions, were there any contemporaneous medical records submitted? Sure. I'll have to qualify that by saying I think defendants didn't meet their burden, but let's say they did within, obviously, a day of the accident, plaintiff began treating. Within less than a month, he got MRIs, and if you look at our expert's report, he quotes the language of them where those reports say for his neck, for his back, for his shoulder, all acute conditions, spasms, shoulder tear, Again, within less than a month of the accident. So I think there's the contemporaneous <coughs> evidence of injury. Did you, dismiss, did you submit those MRIs? Neither party submitted the I'm, reports. It's, I'm just asking about you, right? Intuitive. It's your burden. If, the, if, there's a, if there's a prima facie, then you've got to, then you've got to uh, dispute it. Did you submit the a MRIs? We didn't. Right. I'll okay. just circle back. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'll just circle back to the fact that it was defendant's motion. They didn't submit it. In fact, Dr. Roth. No, but if they made the prima facie, your burden is to make now come up with the issue of fact. Submitting the MRIs would have helped you, I would have thought. I mean, you would think it was there, right? Hundred percent true. If defendant okay. met their burden, I'm assuming I, they met their burden. Now you got to raise a factual issue. Right, but my point is, I don't think they did when they had to. When you say they did, what well, you mean? Did they? Do you think you're arguing that they didn't make their prime Right, decision? correct. We're turning it around, so assuming they did, what did you do to raise a factual issue? Okay, well, you have the MRI. Well, I thought you said you didn't submit the MRI. We did not submit the reports, but defendant's expert said he relied on them. You're right. Defendant's motion, meaning that. Did you submit any like contemporaneous them? treatment records? Any contemporaneous treatment records? The records? No, it was quoting the language. Only of the an MRI. expert for several years later, right? Only an expert report. None of the contemporaneous 
treatment records were submitted. But I just want to make sure that we're both on the same page. But other than our expert referencing the same MRIs that Dr. Roth did and quoting their language. Beyond that, you're 100% correct. No the records contemporaneous, are not there. right. No contemporaneous records. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Kristen Carroll of Olson Elser for defendants' respondents. This court should affirm the lower court's decision because defendants did establish their prima facie burden that plaintiff did not sustain a serious injury in relation to this accident. The only arguments that plaintiff proffered in the lower court and on appeal with respect to Dr. Roth's report was that his straight leg raise test was somehow inadequate because it failed to compare to normal ranges. A litany of decisions of this court supports defendants' position on this point that Dr. Roth's opinion that the straight leg raise test was negative at 90 degrees bilaterally was sufficient objective evidence that there was no serious injury. Plaintiff's contention both on the lower court and on appeal that Dr. Roth did not review the MRI films themselves is contradicted by the record. In Dr. Roth's review of medical records section of his report on page 233, it states that he reviewed the MRI, not the MRI report. Dr. Roth examined the plaintiff, right? Correct, Your Honor. He, okay. It wasn't just based on what he was reading. He actually did a physical examination. Yes, he did a physical examination and measured full range of motion in every plane of each body part. But plaintiff contended that Dr. Roth's report was insufficient because he didn't review the films themselves. However, in his medical discussion of his report, it specifically provides that he reviewed the diagnostic studies, which refutes that argument. And as Your Honor pointed out, plaintiff and opposition failed to submit any contemporaneous limitations close in time to the accident. The only report they submitted was from an examination that occurred two years and three months post-accident. Now, counsel, um, the plaintiff ceased treatment, I believe it was October 2021, right? February of 2021, Your Honor. Excuse me, February. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, what if any explanation uh, did the plaintiff provide with respect to his discontinuance of treatment? Your Honor, plaintiff offered no explanation, much less a reasonable one for his cessation of treatment. Mm -hmm. In plaintiff's reply brief, he did mention that Dr. Wiener's report made reference to at-home exercises, but Dr. Wiener did not say that these at-home exercises were prescribed for plaintiff because more treatment would have been palliative in nature. And because plaintiff failed to offer any explanation for the cessation of treatment, the lower court properly determined that they failed to rebut causation. I just have one more before my colleague. Now, uh, plaintiff was out of work for, I guess, about maybe six weeks or so, but then now continuing to, to work as uh, MTA worker carrying heavy tools and the like. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, contrary to plaintiff's contention, he went back to work on a regular 40-hour-a-week schedule, also worked on his days off, and also worked overtime. There was no indication in this record that he was on any sort of modified duty. If the court has no further questions, we have my question. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honors. I should be less than the minute I asked for. I think the sticking point with you, if I'm reading the room right, is the contemporaneous treatment before we get to any supposed cessation or gaps. And I really have nothing to do but reiterate the other point that defendant relied on the MRI reports without actually submitting them or, in its no, own the, motion. On the MRIs, not on the MRI report. That's a big difference. I, I have to take issue with that because okay. Dr. Roth didn't say film report one or the other, I don't think it's clear from that. I think that he relied on the same exact records that plaintiff did, meaning that we could also rely on them without submitting copies of the reports, just like defendant did. Um, but I think we've already been down that road. So if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll rest on the brief. Thank you. Thank you. De Souza versus Ortiz Osario. I'm still Greg Friedman, and I'm oh. still here for the appellants. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm just going to handle every argument that I, it's fine. 
unless I'm going to lose. Okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I see I'm, I'm doing well so far today. Oh, you never know. But let's see, maybe we could do better here. I'm, I'm going to start with what I think is going to be the sticking point in this case. Two, it's the out of possession landlord defense. We have years of case law on this issue that if it's an out of possession landlord, which this landlord clearly appears to be, you have to show a design defect, structural defect, which would get you into that exception. What is that in this case? Th that's one exception, n no that's doubt. That's really the only exception. Well, I think let's start with the lease first, because we, we made this argument in our brief. No doubt. It has terms in there, broad terms, saying tenants responsible for repairing things. Okay. It also says in the same lease, tenant can't do anything that affects plumbing. It has to let the owner use, maintain, replace pipes. And then you have another section saying if the premises. Yeah, so this, this is a traditional lease, which we've seen similar ones many times. There's nothing distinctive about this lease. It clearly says tenant's responsible for repairs. The landlord's not responsible for repairs. The tenant's responsible for water damage. The tenant is the one who put in this drop ceiling. The tenant's the one responsible for maintaining the drop ceiling. So what takes this case out of the well-established exception? Well, even if the lease did say that, it says at another point, this is a not if the lease 50, 59 of the record, 59 of the record, that if the premises, and that includes the, the tenant's premises, are damaged by fire or any other causes without the tenant's fault, they have to be repaired at the expense of the landlord. Council, is, is, is your position that this, the ceiling dropping or falling was the result of water damage? Is that where you're going with this? And that was the landlord's responsibility to repair? That's what plaintiff's testimony implies based on what she said she'd observed and complained about to the landlord. So it becomes an issue not necessarily Right, but what about the, 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 the part of the record that establishes that in terms of pipes, there are no pipes in that particular area for, and any pipes were about 45 feet away. And how do you get from 45 feet away to right to where the plaintiff is? Sure, so the only person who actually inspected the area was not Ortiz himself, it was his expert, who we know does the inspection five years after the fact. Ceiling's already been fixed, so who knows what happened in the meantime. And what, what he says is- do with the location of the pipes, as my colleague just right, said? Right, what he the says is- The pipes are 45 feet away. There's no dispute about that. There's no contradictory evidence about that. How do you get to it, other than speculation, that could even be water damage? Sure, number one, I think we're aligned on, I, I believe it was a sketch that Ortiz threw into the record saying, Here's the layout and here's the nearest pipe. No, I thought that there was expert testimony. What the expert that. said, and I believe it was the entirety of what he said, was that, well, that testimony. there are pipes nowhere near the location. I don't he think the expert gave any he actual also numbers. He testified that there was no, he lived above the, the premises and that there were no water fixtures or water in that area. It was his study in the bedroom and there was nothing water like above where this happened. So he that did. was he, an addition. Right. He said that there were certain pipes, I think, plumbing pipes in different locations in his apartment. Nowhere near where the right. accident occurred. What we do know is it wasn't just plumbing pipes. I think the expert himself found HVAC equipment right above the area of the accident to try to give any opinion that nothing there could cause condensation. Or if, if I may, because, you know, we also have the... Uh, affidavit of the plaintiff's employer, in addition to the evidence from the defendant himself that said, you know, uh, both of them watched the video and, and it seems that uh, water had absolutely nothing to do with the accident. You know, uh, there was someone who, who was, you know, uh, pushing against the door, the light fixture fell, I can go on and on, but I think I'll just stop there. Can we talk about that? Okay, see the lights red. I'll try to get through these as quickly as possible. If not, I'll address them in rebuttal. For the coworker bumping against the door, I think they really exaggerated this. This was not the Incredible Hulk smashing the door. I mean, I think we've all seen the video, so I don't we've know. We've seen yeah. it, right? Yeah, she, yeah. She generally, Let's talk about sound it. ceiling doesn't collapse with no. that. Neither, Ortiz admitted he did not actually inspect 
anything or investigate after mm -hmm. the accident happened. So you could say I watched the video. It doesn't seem to me like there was a leak. It was the coworker. Is that really dispositive here? And the president of the employer, he never no said. No defective that. condition, none. Well, the only thing I'll challenge you on with that is mm -hmm. the two cases we cited in the brief from this court where a plaintiff just by saying, I looked at the ceiling and I saw there was discoloration, the court said that's enough to indicate a water leak. So to me, that at very least raises credibility issues here. Okay. okay you have answer time. the questions? You have time, rebuttal to, to expand on that if you wish. Good afternoon. Alejandra Gill of Heidel, Petoni, Murphy & Bach for the defendant Guillermo Ortiz Osario. As your honors have already recognized, there's a lot of precedent in this case um, for out of possession landlord. There's really no dispute here that Mr. Ortiz Osorio was out of possession. So what about the allegation that it was a leak from above that caused the damage? What's your response to that? Your Honor, there's absolutely no evidence that there was a leak. Uh, plaintiff herself never testified that she reported a leak in that specific area. Her testimony was about brown stains on the roof. Didn't you also put in an expert's affidavit? There was an expert who looked it over? Yes, Your Honor. You have that? And, yes. And in response to that, I didn't see anything from the plaintiff contradicting your expert. Correct. There is no rebuttal of our expert um, opinion that this incident was not caused by any water damage. Uh, there was no testimony from the plaintiff that she reported any leaks. There was nothing in the incident report that was filed saying that there was water when the ceiling collapsed or that they had reported any issues with water um, prior to this incident. And was it, is it also true that it was the tenant, not the landlord, who put in the drop ceiling? That's correct. Right, and, the, and the landlord had nothing to do, so it wasn't an Espinoza type thing where the landlord had anything to do with putting in the drop ceiling. Correct. Okay. The landlord had nothing to do with um, installing the ceiling or its maintenance or its repair as is set out in the lease and which is further expanded on the, on the affidavits. Um, plaintiff tries to call into question the terms of the lease, completely ignoring the affidavits that are submitted by the parties to the lease, which is what is controlling in this case. The case so there's no there's no question, right? The the lessee says it's my responsibility. The landlord says it's the lessee's responsibility, and the lessee says it's the lessee's responsibility. So that's there's correct. no there can't be an ambiguity argument when both parties agree that's what the lease says, and both parties agree that the terms of the lease continued on after the termination of the at, at the start of the month to month tenancy, right? That's correct, Your Honor. They were holdover tenants um, per the terms of the lease. And the case of Henry v. Hamilton Equities, which is a court of appeals case, is directly on point. It emphasizes that the agreement that controls whether or not a landlord is out of possession is the agreement between the landlord and the tenant. Um, and that is what needs to be analyzed. In this case, they tried to argue that because the plaintiff had made some complaints about some issues in the area to the landlord um, at some point, that that created some obligation for him to make repairs, even though plaintiff never said that he agreed to make repairs during the tenancy of the tenant. Um, and even if he had, any promises made to a third party who was not a party to the lease would be irrelevant. And, and counsel here, uh, anywhere in the complaint where the plaintiff alleges a significant structural or uh, design defect here? No, Your Honor. There's uh, no allegation that it was a load-bearing wall, that it was structural, that there was any statutory violations, um, which would put the case, um, the status as an out-of-possession landlord into question. There's no such evidence here. And if the court determines that Mr. Ortiz Osorio really was an out-of-possession landlord, then that um, the issues of whether there was constructive notice and whether res ipsa apply are decided because if he was out of possession, he obviously didn't have control of the area for res ipsa to um, apply. And if he had had constructive notice, it wouldn't matter because he was out of possession. So we, it's our position that his status as an out of possession landlord is pretty well settled by the lease and by the affidavits. And that um, is why the lower court granted summary judgment and the order should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you. 
and I'll just address one point, and then I'm going to sit back down. As to the You don't want to argue the rest of the appeals today? <laughs> no, I'm taking that offer back. <laughs> no. uh. Nope, that one's, that one's off the table. Just with regard to plaintiff's testimony that Ortiz had promised to repair. Number one, I understand that, according to plaintiff, what he said was, I will fix it once family services vacates. He didn't say, I'll fix it once they vacate because I can't go in there and do anything. He didn't give any explanation for it. And here, you can show that a landlord retains control from the case law by a promise. That's all it says. And if you credit plaintiff's testimony, which we have to, she Can said- Can no longer be an out of possession landlord once the tenant vacates? Because they'll have to get it ready for the next tenant? Yeah, he, he would, but so what, he didn't say he I can't fix it then? now because I'm out of possession. Okay, oh, thank there's you. The, there's the light, thank you. Thank you. 20 Broad Street versus Sonder, USA. Your honors, may it please the court, Adam Safer of Goulston and Stores, on behalf of the uh, appellants, tenant, and their guarantors. Uh, we submit that the uh, Supreme Court got it wrong when the case was dismissed on summary judgment where there was no discovery. Uh, ultimately, this is a case about Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is like pneumonia with a 10% fatality rate. Tenants' business is renting large blocks of space and making it available to their guests. Well, why don't, why don't we talk about as many causes of action yeah. here, but, but it really has to be broken down into the causes of action because different causes of actions have different requirements. So a number of, if there was no abandonment of the premises, a number of the causes of action fall, the breach of quiet enjoyment um, and some of the others. You claim that the abandonment didn't occur in June, but both of the surrender agreements in the record were for later dates past June. So how how does how is your argument supported that the abandonment occurred in June rather than at a later date? So, so these are the facts in the record. In February of 2020, two people came down with Legionnaire's disease, and the tenant notified its guests of the Legionnaire's disease. In March 2020, <laughs> two other cases of Legionnaire's disease uh, became known. And tenants started evacuating the building in March and had completely evacuated its, its, its portion of the premises um, by June 3rd. Uh, Council, in March of 2020, was there not um, communication via email from the tenant to the landlord that it was experiencing low occupancy as a result of the pandemic? Was that? So that does create the fact, but the fact of the pandemic and the fact of COVID does create conflicting information, okay? But that is an issue for discovery. That's not an issue that can be resolved on summary judgment. The fact of the matter is <coughs> the Legionnaire's disease happened in February and March. It wasn't contained. They offered their tenants accommodations because of Legionnaire's disease. But Council, I still, ha still haven't heard the response to the original question, which is that the surrender agreements, which is a clear acknowledgement by both parties that the, the premises are being surrendered as of, of that date occurred after the date you're claiming the abandonment occurred. So why isn't that evidence which clearly contradicts uh, your position about the June abandonment? So, so it, that evidence does not contradict at all. There's, there are three pieces of evidence that the landlord points to. There's a June 7 letter from Tenants Council. There's the surrender agreement dated in September. And there's another letter from Tenants Council in October. And those um, three pieces of evidence, and I was just looking for where they are in the record, but anyways, those three pieces of evidence um, speak to two different issues. They speak to tenant after having fully abandoned the property by um, uh, June 3rd, 2020, negotiating to reoccupy the premises if the landlord wanted to, but the landlord improperly terminated the lease instead of negotiating. So let me, can I interrupt you for a second and ask you, after after June 3rd, you say the last tenant moved down on June 3rd? Correct, there were no guests. So, okay, so uh, did you have the keys to the premises? I had the keys. Could you move, could you go into the premises? 
We could go into the premises. Did you, could you like use the bathrooms and lock the doors in the premises? I don't think the record speaks to that, but presumably. Yeah, but of course presumably you could. So. That's the whole point. You didn't abandon. You didn't surrender. That's not, that's the whole point you're, you're, of the surrender agreements being later. You can't say you abandoned the premises and surrendered them without, without while still retaining the ability to go in, to make repairs, to go to the bathroom, to do whatever there is, right? Um, with respect, that is not the law in New York. Okay. With respect, that is not the law in New York. In 225 E64th Street against Pristowski, which we um, cite, 96 AD 3536, this court affirmed a, fi a finding of constructive eviction where a tenant was prevented from using the premises while landlord conducted roof repairs, but held the constructive eviction ended after the repairs were complete. Uh, counsel, I have a question. Uh, did the Department of Health ever, excuse me, did the Department of Health ever issue any communication requiring, you know, the residents to vacate the premises? No, but that's not required for a constructive eviction. I didn't ask that. I just asked that one question, but I have some others. Um, now, June 29th, there was a letter at that time then seeking to move out the 10th through the 12th floors after the June 3rd, right? That's a yes Correct, or no. Correct, but that relates to just, oh. just, it's important to understand there's a difference when you evacuate all the people oh. from a dangerous condition and trying to make the premises room clean. I understand. So, so now I'm going further landlord. to the next letter, September 9th, and that related to the seventh floor units. That was the surrender agreement I think you're referring to, and in that agreement, the tenant reserved all rights. Mm -hmm. had already and, made out a constructive mm -hmm. eviction claim and had reserved all rights. And again, those documents relate to trying to return the premises in room clean condition for the benefit of the landlord. They do not have to deal with abandonment. There were no people in the building after June 3, no guests, no employees, no operations. I understand. 11 floors were completely gone. Mm -hmm. Council, since we're about out of, we are out of time, I'm gonna give you a quick chance though to address the casualty. Why? Isn't your argument about the casualty precluded by the case law that's developed around COVID? Because even though it's not COVID, uh, it's similar in that it's not an immediate event which causes a required to immediately abandon the premises, which is what a casualty normally refers to. So why aren't you precluded from arguing casualty under the lease? Okay, so th those are very different circumstances. Um, COVID is an airborne disease passed by humans. Legionnaire's disease is a, um, a pneumonia type of bacteria that's passed by the well, water systems in the building. I understand they're different, but they're both not, okay, go ahead. No, that's the difference. The difference is one is trans transfer from human to human, and so evacuating a building wouldn't have any effect. The other is transfer from the building itself, from the water system in the building, so evacuating the building is important so for your own health and safety. Okay, so they're very thank different in that regard. Thank you. For the respondent, Nativ Wynarski from the law firm of Cook and Marino, Wynarski and Bittens. So what about the argument that abandonment is different than a surrender agreement? And the fact that there was a later surrender agreement doesn't preclude the argument that they actually abandoned the premises at an earlier date. So I heard my adversary state to this court that the case law is that you can abandon but yet not offer up possession and there's no case law to that effect. We can go back to Boreal versus Lawton in 1882 Court of Appeals case, which said there is no case sustaining a constructive eviction absent a surrender of possession. Justice Song, you were on the International Development versus Westchester case of 2021. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Where also you had a tenant who was not operating, who was not operating the premises and said, well, we can't operate and therefore we are constructively evicted. And the court said, so long as you're holding on to possession, there is no constructive eviction. It is completely anathema to over 100 years of case law to have the idea that a tenant can say, I've been constructively evicted. But what? Not what about the argument that, hey, we really did abandon it earlier. We didn't, we didn't sign a surrender agreement to later, a formal surrender agreement. We were out by that point, and we had left the premises. Any way you look at it, in all of the cases which use these terms, surrender, vacate, abandon, they all use it within the context of abandoned possession, vacate possession, because the idea that a tenant can dangle the key in front of the landlord and say, I'm not paying rent, 
I'm going to leave, but I'm going to hold possession, not let you relet the space, and I'm going to continue to not uh, let you relet the space while I claim constructive eviction is against hundreds of years of case law in this department. You have to surrender possession. Look at Barash, look at all Court of Appeals case law. There must be that surrender of possession. And that's why the constructive eviction defense didn't hold. Do you want to address the casualty provision in the lease sure. and how, how that should be interpreted? And sure. So, Your Honor, uh, you were on the GAP versus 170 Broadway panel, um, which dealt with um, the casualty provision within the context of COVID. And as, as Your Honor, as the court stated in that position, absent physical damage, there is no casualty. That casualty provision only exists within the context. Can't the of argument be made, though, that Legionnaire's disease is different than COVID and that it does leave a thumbprint on the building in a different way that COVID does not? You have to have a seismic, cataclysmic event that physically disrupts the, the premises. It's not the limited to COVID. Says. That's what the Court of Appeals said in the recent case, in the consolidated yes. restaurant case. I mean, it, it essentially affirming what the, the case, the, the gap case. The gap. the gap case, right? Yes. I mean, that's what it's saying. It's got to be like un, un, totally uninhabitable and gone. You're uh, out. Uninhabitable, gone, untenable. And let's not forget that while this tenant occupied floors two through nine, this is a 28 story building. The landlord was renting out 300 other units. As you said, Your Honor, there. there it, it didn't prevent them from continuing to re to rent and use this space. So the casualty provision clearly it made it did more difficult, but it didn't stop them. Absolutely, and certainly, just to answer again directly your question, there was no DOH order ordering anyone to leave. And in fact, there were DOH notices which said future guests can continue to remain in the premises. I do want to address the other aspect of it, which was that correspondence, that email that you brought up. Because I think we should disabuse ourselves of the notion that this was a case about Legionella, or constructive eviction, or casualty. You see in that email exactly what this was about. They said, our occupancy rate dropped from 88% from to 30% because of, they didn't say uh, Legionella. And this is after the Legionella was already there for months. They said because of COVID-19. And we don't have a recession-proof clause, that we have an 88% of our other leases except for this case. And I, I also note that we have a number of justices here who have been on the commercial division and served on the landlord tenant part of commercial 52. Ask yourselves, how many times have you seen a tenant get a notice to cure on a multi-million dollar lease and not make any attempt to seek to get a Yellowstone injunction? Right? Nah, we're all, we're all having PTSD. Uh, PTSD. That never <laughs> happens. And why oh doesn't God. it happen? Because the landlord, the tenant's going to seek to secure that leasehold, unless the tenant wants out of the lease. And all this was with a method to seek to extricate itself out of the lease and back end itself in terms of legal theories that just simply didn't hold. Thank you. Your Honor, a few points. One is, it's important to understand that the Legionnaires that the Department of Health um, identified was on the 11th floor and below, and that was in that water loop. And so it related to that part of the property and that part of the premises that tenant occupied, and it didn't relate to the floors above. So uh, the, to the, the argument that, um, well, there were floors above where the Legionnaires disease, they were not evacuated, that doesn't matter. And the COVID argument that people left because of COVID, we're not talking about people leaving. We're not talking about the difference between 33% and 82% or whatever the number is. We're talking about zero. We're talking about no tenants, no employees, no operations whatsoever. And with respect to the, the, the legal argument that you have to hand back the keys, I urge the court to look at two cases, 225 E64th Street, 96 AD 3rd, 536, Mimjack Company against Randolph, 140, 80, second, 245, both by this court, and there was no handing back the even keys in either of those even cases. Even if you don't have to hand back the keys, by subsequently entering into a formal surrender agreement, it negates an earlier abandonment. That's not true. It specifically reserved all rights. That's a, it specifically reserved all rights. Again, the tenant was obviously trying to um, limit the harm to the landlord by 
returning the property in room fee. Wait, but, but so you're saying just because you left, you can, that you're, that you left a premises that no one shut down, no one said could, was uninhabitable, nothing like that. You left it and you're entitled to allege constructive eviction? We abandoned the property because Legionnaire's disease is fatal in 10% of the population. There was a DOH to... order that was, no one said that, I think what the order said was put in some filters, right? No. Or no. did no. DOH tell you to d abandon the premises? It did not tell us to Did abandon. anybody tell you, did your experts say abandon the premises? Oh, the record is silent on that point. Right, the exactly. The is silent on that point, but the fact of the matter is, that the tenant did abandon the premises. There well, it's not people. actually silent because there are a number of DOH. Uh, but they don't. But they don't okay. address that issue at all. Okay. They address precautions that people are supposed to take, but it does not address that issue at all. And there was no obligation of the tenant to subject its guests to a disease that's ten percent fatality. And I urge the court also just to look at one other thing in the record, if you, if if I could. The time's up, but you have one more sentence. Just one more sentence. Uh, the record 1529 to 1534 is the um, Department of Health's final report, and it goes through the chronology of uh, what happened in that building, and I urge the court to look at that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, U.S. Bank versus Naren. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Ronald P. Lebeck of Friedman Bartolo, LLP, for the respondent. Uh, Your Honors, uh, the lower court properly granted respondent's motion to amend the complaint pursuant to CPLR 3012B. Uh, leave to amend is freely given where there's no prejudice, surprise, and where the amendment is not palpably insufficient or patently devoid of merit. Um, here, the appellant can't claim prejudice by the amendment because he was aware of the facts surrounding the amendment and he was aware of the court's prior ruling in the 2007 action uh, on, on which the amendment is based, and he's not hindered in his preparation of his defenses or his case whatsoever. The, uh, the uh, amendment is not palpably without merit. In fact, it's based on the court's prior decision that uh, the appellant um, had made payments and brought the default of his loan current as of August 15, 2008. So a September 1, 2008 default was uh, properly uh, I, ex I, I just have one, one question about the payments being current. Were, were those payments not rejected by the bank? They were rejected by the bank. Were there payments made subsequent to that, or was it just No, there were, no payment, there were no payments subsequent to that. So what, what had happened was um, the appellant was told that he was, be, he was getting a forbearance agreement um, that would um, be considered to pay the arrears back on the loan. Um, uh, and he immediately made the payments. Um, he didn't get an agreement he, uh, until three days later it was sent to him, um, and the, the prior, sir, the prior uh, mortgager rejected those payments because they didn't know why they had received them. Um, but let me just ask you, on the bank's record, the bank credited the, the tenant for the, the, um, yeah, the, the bank, borrower. Yes, the bank's basically out for the that money. Um, right, they credited, even though they, were, they sent back the checks, they credited the borrower for that money, right? That, that's correct. And that's the basis of the motion to amend. Yes, okay, exactly. Good. Uh, so th they really couldn't, based on the court's prior determination, allege that it was continued to be a July 1st 2007 default based on those payments that were made. Um, so uh, again, um, respondent need not show beyond a reasonable doubt or there's no question of fact with regard to the amendment, only that it's not palpably insufficient, which I think is clearly the case. Um, appellant's cross motion for summary judgment was also uh, properly denied. Uh, appellant failed to eliminate any uh, issues of tribal fact with regard to his defenses, particularly his statute of limitations defense, which is based on the uh, uh, acceleration of the loan in that prior 2007 I think action. nobody appealed uh, Judge Barron's decision, right? No one did, decision. no. Yeah, um, that's pretty good, right? <laughs> Hindsight's 2020 vision on that one, right? I, I mean, I, I th It turned out pretty good for you guys. Yeah, um, so <laughs> at, at, at any rate... Um, Don't push your luck, I guess, in that part, right? But, but with the dismissal of that action and the court's determination that the default was cured, yeah. then I see my time is up. Uh, I'll rely on my brief for the remainder of my arguments and thank the court for its time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Hilton Wiener versus Zink.
May it please the court, I'm Stephen Legum. I represent the defendant appellant. Uh, the holding by the lower court, most respectfully submit, is, is novel and unsupportable. Uh, a single member- what? It's uh, the holding concerning a single member LLC being interchangeable with the individual is just not supportable. It's not supported by the limited liability law. It's not supported by any authority. And I would submit that the plaintiff actually recognizes this because the plaintiff moved right away from that and starts to argue for the first time before this court that the, uh, there was an assignment. The only problem with that argument is, A, there was no assignment. No assignment was alleged below. It was let, since there's no one else here, let's bypass the standing issue for a minute and talk about uh, the denial of the um, jury trial, since that seems to be the more difficult issue at least to me on this appeal, um, that the other side clearly did request a jury trial and was denied it. Uh, and why weren't they entitled to the jury trial on a quantum merit claim? Well, Your Honor, we timely filed a demand for a jury. It was filed. There was no question about it. So you're the ones, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up the sides. You wanted the jury. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so yes. you're arguing it should be set aside. We, we wanted a jury. We timely filed a demand. We appeared the day the matter was on for trial. I advise the court that we have a jury demand filed. For some reason, uh, the trial judge took offense, that was the word she used, to this request, called it dilatory. I said, I'm ready to pick a tr uh, jury today. I, I think we're entitled, clearly we're entitled. The relief sought was money, monetary relief. The cases have consistently held, if the relief sought is purely legal, is mon a monetary relief, you're entitled to a jury. We were entitled your to a jury. Your argument is it should be remanded so you can get your jury trial that you're arguing you're entitled to? Well, your Honor, I don't think we get to that because I think that the summary judgment motion should be reversed. Assuming you're unsuccessful on the standing argument. Okay. Yes, Your Honor, because we have, this is the wrong plaintiff. And well, counsel, let me ask you, at the time here on this side, at the time you had the original attorney's fee hearing, had the plaintiff yet been disbarred? At the time, the plaintiff was not disbarred when, the, when he represented Mr. Zenk. He, he was subsequently disbarred. Okay. At, the time the, uh, at the time that the matter came on for trial, he'd already been disbarred. And that's another problem. Not allowed to cross-examine him on his underlying felony. Not allowed to cross-examine him on his disbarment. And worse than that, he lied to the court. He said, I didn't fight the disbarment because I was ready to retire. This court's opinion said, he opposed it. He opposed the disbarment. And then on top of it all, couldn't get into it because I was completely cut off by the trial judge, but this man, after he was disbarred, continued to practice law. The issue here is that there was no cause of action proven initially on the summary judgment motion, and certainly if the court finds there was, I was deprived my right to a jury trial, and I respectfully submit that the uh, judgment should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Harris versus George Comfort and Sons. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Christopher Ruggiero with the law firm of Colin and Dykeman LLP for the appellants, George Comfort and Sons, Nomura Holdings, Turner Construction Company, and WWP Office. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to say how great it feels to be back here in person and not in my pajama pants. <laughs> But uh, so this case is about an arising out of contractual indemnity. Uh, Counsel, the appellants. Let me ask you, we, are, we are familiar with the case. The only claim that's now remaining is a 241.6 claim having to do with debris. But the party that you're seeking indemnification from uh, was responsible for lighting, and there is no lighting claim left in the lawsuit anymore. The only claim left is debris, which they're not responsible for. So why is there a viable indemnification? Well, co correct, Your Honor, but the plaintiff testified three times, and his coworker testified once. The plaintiff said, I couldn't see the debris but because the he, lighting was inadequate. Didn't he withdraw all claims which asserted that his lighting was, his accident was caused in some way by the lighting as opposed to the debris, or that they were both, I mean, he could have clearly pursued a claim that both things caused this accident. It was a combination of the debris and the bad lighting, but he did not. He chose to not continue any claim having to do with the lighting, therefore taking the position that it was only the debris 
that caused this accident. And once he did that, what, what indemnification claim is left then? Well, the, we're dealing with an arising out of indemnity provision, which is broader than a claim. It talks about injury. It talks about fines. It talks about penalties. Yeah, hold on a second. But when you talk about arising out of, that has to be in line with something that the tortfeasor did, right? It's not how they work. But they're not, they're not responsible for debris cleanup, right? They're only responsible for lighting. Unless you're showing, unless there's proof in the record that the debris was all types of, I don't know, ballast and light fixtures and all that other stuff that kind of clog the passageway. I don't think that that's, so it, how's it arising out of? And the other thing about the lighting is that I got something in my notes here that the plaintiff signed a statement that that lighting was fine, unless I'm reading the wrong case, which could possibly be possible. Well, well Your Honor, the, the plaintiff testified that he couldn't see the debris. No, I'm talking, yeah, but, but, you know, but he signs a statement that he says the lighting was fine. But he testified. So. He testified he couldn't see the debris because okay. of the lighting when it's inac inadequate. And this is, a tr this is a jury question. Whether or not it arose out of their work is a jury question. It's a question if there's a factual issue in the record right. as to whether or not the lighting caused the accident. But if the plaintiff himself is not arguing that, I'm not sure what's left of the lighting argument. Well, the plaintiff did testify that the lighting caused no, but it doesn't accident. matter what the plaintiff, if there's a judgment, right, it's going to be on 241.6 based on debris. So what are you going to get indemnified for from the lighting guy? It's only based on debris. There's nothing for you to get indemnified for. Well, it doesn't. There's not going to be a claim for damages based on lighting. So there's no basis for indemnification. There doesn't need to be a claim. According to the case law in Hunter Roberts, right, you're right. we don't look at the specific incident. We look at the surrounding circumstances. I, I, I don't and the judge in the underlying case said it has to be proximate cause of fault, which is clearly reversible. I, plus, I, it's a procedural impropriety. Okay, so uh, uh, let's say I agree with you about, you know, rising out of doesn't have to be a claim and everything. So we go forward with this case. 241.6 is the only claim that's left, correct? Correct. So that we go forward with this case and we find that plaintiff's comparatively at fault because comparative fault of the plaintiff can factor into the 241.6 claim. The indemnification you're seeking now, and I think Supreme Court touched on it, you're basically asking for us now to indemnify you for plaintiff's negligence instead of their negligence because that's what it's all about. Because, to, because by getting rid of the common law and the 200 claim, that takes away any potential question on the verdict sheet about Forrest's liability or Forrest's, you know, fault in this. So all you have now is 241.6, plaintiff and the remaining defendant. That's your client. No Forrest. So that if we do that and I give you the identification that you're asking for that's arising out of, I would be essentially saying that, hey, Forrest, guess what? You don't have to just indemnify your, the contract or the GC, but you got to also indemnify them against the plaintiffs also for its own acts. But under that reasoning, it's the same fault as the underlying judge. It's reading a negligence component to an arising out of provision. There's no negligence component. Not, they don't have to be at fault. It just has to have some connection to their work. Right, but the lighting connection. claim was dismissed. It's not even like it's just hanging out there and there's been no determination. It was affirmatively dismissed from the case. But that's with respect to negligence. That's not res with respect to arising out of. There's cases, but, uh, Barnes versus MTA, Burns versus Mercantile. So you're, you're telling me, hold on, hold, hold on. Is it your position that under 241.6, where you have to also allege a specific industrial code violation, and the only industrial code violation that survives right now is about debris, you are saying that that doesn't matter as long as there was some kind of uh, some subcontractor anywhere or this specific co subcontractor who dealt with lighting for which there is a separate industrial code violation that's no longer in the case, it doesn't matter? No, They're going to be liable some, anyway? There has to be some causal connection, which is the inadequate lighting which the plaintiff testified contributed to his accident. It's in his testimony. We don't okay. need negligence. Let's say I buy that. Okay, I buy that. Let's, let's say I buy that argument that you're raising. That would mean, again, on the verdict sheet, right. it would be a comparative fault between your client and the plaintiff because he says it's inadequate lighting. He went ahead anyway. He tripped and fall. Jury comes back, 50% to plaintiff, 50% to your client. How is it then at that point that Forrest would be required to indemnify you? Because that would be, in a sense, in my mind now, you will be, they will be indemnifying you not for what they did, because there's no finding of their, uh, uh, right, you don't think it has anything to do with 
liability, but it's arising out of, but it's all the plaintiff's fault. So I will be indemnifying you basically for plaintiff's act, acts. I don't know if well, that's there correct. Would be a, there would be an, a special interrogatory in the jury sheet whether or not the work arose from Forrest's uh, You know, that's not site. going to be there because the only claim that will go to a jury right. is a claim <laughs> for debris. The only thing the jury is going to decide in this trial is the one claim left, which is a claim whether the debris caused the accident. That's the only determination the jury is going to make. It's not going to make a determination whether or not the lighting caused the accident because there's no claim before. Well, if there's a contractual, gonna, if there's yeah. a contractual indemnity claim, that will be on the verdict sheet. And if they find that there's some causal connection to Forrest's work, then there's a contractual indemnity finding against Forrest. Okay, let's hear from opposing counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, James Walsh from London Fisher on behalf of the respondent, Forrest Electric. Um, Your Honor, so just a question. Was Forrest even present on the day of the accident? Were they even there? There's no testimony that they were on the fourth floor where this accident happened. Um, and I think Your Honor's hit it right on the head. The only claim left is <coughs> completely vicarious. Could there be a claim on the verdict sheet be, if, about um, whether the, the lighting caused the accident if the plaintiff's not alleging that? No. How could that be? It, I, I don't think it can be, Your Honor. That's why as soon as the plaintiff withdrew it, we stood up and moved to dismiss the third party action on contractual. Because essentially that would be a claim that plaintiff's not making, right? Correct. And it would, and it would, I don't know, I can't see it in my mind how that could be. I mean, by withdrawing the 200 in common law negligence claim, that really put the nail in the coffin, right, in terms of your liability, because that would have been the wiggle room right there to get that interrogatory on the verdict sheet, right, because there'd be some evidence in there. And in fact, you know, since we're only tied to what we have in terms of universe, it's really the, compar the plaintiff's comparative fault, right? right? I mean, okay, let's assume that the lighting was poor. Let's assume that he couldn't see where he was going. Let's assume that he was totally blinded in terms of how dark it is. He went ahead, he tripped himself, that was comparative fault on his part. And I still can't get over the fact that then you'll be indemnifying him for his own, pro I mean, indemnifying the GC or the, for the plaintiff's acts when it's not my, it's not arising out of whatever I did, but somebody else's. I don't think that's how this indemnification clause works. I would agree with you, Your Honor, and I'll just mention briefly two court of appeals cases. There's Moroni, it says some causal connection is required. We obviously don't have that here. And going back as far as 1985, the Niagara case said the language has to be construed to encompass only loss and damage that reasonably appears to have been within the intent of the parties. I mean, by, that, by the analogy they're making, because Forrest performed some electrical work on this project any time an accident happened and there was light. No, no, he's saying more than that. He's saying at some point plaintiff said, you know what, the lighting was bad. But then the plaintiff withdrew that claim, right? Correct. And plaintiff's counsel said openly when he withdrew it that he couldn't prove it. Right. Look, the lighting thing is still going to come up. Somewhere along the trial is going to come up because it's a comparative fault issue here. Okay, sure. That's going to come out at some point, right? But yes. I, can't, I can't imagine because if I were to agree with what was being argued, that would, stand, that would turn on its head, the indemnification clause, because then the indemnity would be indemnifying the, the indemnitor for anything that someone else does when the contract only limits me to what I do. Correct. Right? I mean, and also in some cases, it also protects the indemnitor if they did something, you know, to the full extent of the law, right? Yes. I can't, I, that would be an expansion. I, I'm, I'm listening to the, an expansion of the indemnification clause. Yes, Your Honor. There's no evidence Forrest was on the fourth floor, no evidence Forrest was notified, asked to put lighting in that room, not proven that Forrest even had responsibility for that area, and the contemporaneous documents, including. Uh, appellant's own documents say the lighting was fine. And, and, and there's no uh, evidence that uh, Forrest created the debris because you were doing the electrical work. Correct. Counsel conceded that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, just once again, that the plaintiff did sign a statement saying that the accident was caused because of the debris, the lighting was fine, and, and I'll just say this. He saw the debris before the fall. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. If there's Thank no you. further questions, thank you. Uh, if I may please the court just in reply. Uh, we're dealing with two issues here. One is whether an arising out of claim can survive when there's no liability claim against the indemnitor. And the, the answer is yes. The second question is, 
Does this arise out of the respondent's work? That's the jury question. That's what the lower court took away from the jury. The 25-page brief that respondent submitted is arguing it doesn't rise out of our work. Well, that's the jury question. It's, is a claim can be permitted under a rising out of yes. It happens all the time in the employee-employer relationship. There's no claim against the employer. You can't bring a claim. But you can still have contractual indemnity against that employer if it arises from their work. No claim is necessary. No liability is necessary. Just needs causal connection. Incident two, arising from, originating from. That's all it needs. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Diamond Realty versus Jakob Gold. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Um, Adam Sherman of Jacobs PC for the, uh, the appellants. Uh, this is an appeal that arises out of uh, the lower court. They granted um, summary judgment, and then uh, a judgment resulted. Um, the, the error that the lower court had was this is um, a commercial lease where you have a, a, a landlord and a tenant where there's no acceleration clause in the lease that's undisputed. I'm a little confused by your argument, to be quite honest, because there is no acceleration clause. Clause, which means you can't you can't pursue claims for rent that's you know beyond the litigation, but this complaint clearly states in the first cause of action that the landlord is seeking all rent, which may become due and owing to plaintiff from December first, twenty twenty, through and including the date plaintiff obtains a judgment against defendants. Mm -hmm. So from the very first day of this action in the complaint, mm -hmm. the landlord is seeking all rent due to the date of the judgment. So under those circumstances, why is there any need to amend the addendum clause or amend the complaint or do anything since it's already in the initial complaint that they're seeking that? Uh, because that, what you just said, is not a permissible cause of action why under well-settled thought because- it's not accelerating, it's saying if it comes due during the time of this action, right. we're gonna collect it, not anything beyond so without an acceleration clause, you're limited to the amount that's set forth in the complaint in terms of the monetary relief of the rent that accrued at the time of the filing or why? at the time why, of the Why is it limited? Right. It's never, it's never, in, and having done, well, of us having done many of these cases, it's oh, never limited. It's tip. never limited to the date the action is actually commenced or else you'd constantly be like running after your, your tail, amending it to keep getting new rent. No. You always get to get the rent as long as you have a clause like this through the time the action ends during the course of that uh, action. And, and my days in part 52, if I recall, is that I took evidence of when the complaint is filed and the landlord, the commercial landlord, would provide evidence that there were current defaults through the today's date of the trial. Mm -hmm. And I simply amended the complaint at that point because the proof was provided to me that they uh, did Your that. Honor, if I may, uh, yeah. that, that's a difference here, that that wasn't done. Um, so I, I like done. that wasn't done here. Well, why and would it need to be done when it's already in the complaint? And like, I just have one follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. Is that would you agree that there's a difference between asking for monies owed through the rest of the lease as opposed to monies owed through the judgment? Or are you saying that's the exact same thing? No, that under the case law, that's the exact same thing, and that's impermissible because essentially. He, so I like to even point. Uh, your honors to page 19 and 20 of the respondents brief uh, because they actually ironically uh, highlighted the mistake. Um, at best, you are allowed to, you are limited to the relief that you seek at the time of the motion for summary judgment is filed. So then let, let's follow that thought. Sure. As the case progresses and the rent continues to be owed up until the date the court issues a decision or a judgment, what happens to those monies that are owed? So sure, um, really what should have happened here is on December 2020, a motion for summary judgment, su summary judgment was made. The decision on that motion should have granted the relief sought in that motion, or if they had made a motion to amend at that point, then I agree, that didn't happen here. And um, if you look at page 19 and 20 of the respondent's brief, they actually quote, and I'll quote from their brief. At this juncture, the plaintiff can only recover rents that have accrued through the date it filed its notice of motion 
And that was not done here. Instead, you had a motion for summary judgment filed in December of 2020, and you had a year and a half of an inquest till an inquest was held. And then ambush at that inquest, they allowed you to essentially accelerate. Why is it an ambush? No, acceleration is when you're seeking amounts that occur after the date judgment is entered, which you can do if you have an acceleration clause. You say, not only do we want rent for, for rents that accrue during the course of the action, we want rents for five years down the road. That's acceleration. Nothing in this. I'm not sure where's your this argument. Is two, that anything it's two in years this, down the road, no, based on based on what happened here. I'll ask me a question. Let's go, sorry, Your Honor. I'm not sure where in this action there's any argument that could be made that there's been an acceleration. Because you had a motion for summary judgment filed in December 2020, you had a specific amount. I believe at that time was $152,000, and then you had an inquest held a year and a half later, and then boom the number ballooned to $625,000. But also in paragraph uh, 21 of the complaint, in addition to the foregoing, plaintiff reserves the right to seek and obtain a money judgment against defendants for all unpaid fixed rent and additional rent, which may become due and owing to plaintiff by defendants from December 1st, 2020, through and including the date plaintiff obtains judgment against defendants. What's wrong with that? That type of cause of action is impermissible. I don't know what you mean by impermissible. What it, case it says has, you can't do that? I, um, we, we all have seen that many times, as have we seen motions to conform the pleading to the proof, which was made here at the end of the inquest. I don't understand what, what case says you can't do that. Uh, sure, Your Honor. Um, actually, if you look at 640 Broadway Owner Subsidiary LLC versus Cafe Angelink, that's on page 20 of the respondent's brief. Um, there What's are. That? What's that site today? Um, Twenty-two NY Slip Op Thirty Twenty. Um, That's a trial court decision. Is that a right? There's also. There's Sorry, is that a trial court decision, or a appellate division? No, that's a trial court decision. Ah, uh, okay. And then there's also there's um, there's the Court of Appeals case, uh, Muffler Holding Court v. S J H S J Bloom Inc. What's the site to that? Uh, Three hundred eight NY 570, 1955. 1955? A lot of things have happened since 1955, but okay. Absolutely, I agree, Your Honor. Uh, there's also, um, there's- you Got something in this century? Yes, I do. Um, Utility Garage Corp versus National Biscuit uh, Co. 71 AD 2D 578. 71 AD 2D 578? Yes, uh, also um, this court's uh, decision- I got it. I, that's fine, I'm just gonna, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you straight up, what do you say? I mean, the head Let him introduce, he didn't yeah, yeah, he introduced himself. <laughs> Who is he? Yes, yes, yes sorry. I just may, may I'm so excited. Your Honor. Our 52 is coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Kaposi, uh, Tartar, Krinsky, and Drogan, um, on behalf of the respondent. So do you think these cases say that this is impermissible to get, uh, um, to seek judgment through the end of, through the, seek amounts due through the day that judgment is entered? No, the, these cases are inapplicable to what occurred here. These cases that are all cited are situations like Your Honor just said, where a cause of action was asserted for all rents that had not even come, had not even accrued yet. Pa past the day of judgment, like for the ten-year lease, the entirety of the, the ten-year lease. Right, right, right. And that's, and that's not what we're talking yes, about here. That's not what we're talking about here. That's what happened in all these cases that that he just cited. Okay. Um, and I know, as many of your honors are very familiar with Part 52 and, and all of this, uh, this happens all the time. What, what, what occurred at the lower court was proper, and it was in accord with, with um, uh, their sound discretion to, to conform the, uh, the pleadings to the evidence presented at the following of a uh, complete evidentiary hearing. Um, and a lot of the cases that we cited are trial court decisions, but they, they highlight the fact that, um, that this has occurred on motions for default judgment, where um, justices would, would award accrued rent through the date of the motion. Summary judgment, where they would accrue. Uh, now here, you had a, an entire hearing. This wasn't even on a motion. Um, so. And there was no surprise, because you sought that money in your yeah, complaint, and all right? Of the, and all of the accrued rent, all of the rents were fixed rents. And there wasn't any surrender of the premises, was there? No, they abandoned, but never surrendered. Okay. They abandoned at some point during the pendency of the, of the action. Um, so you know the rents continued to accrue, and and at the you know at the end of, of the we, we didn't receive uh, my client did not receive a dime past uh, a dime of rent uh, or additional rent past the date of the hearing. So 
So by the time the judgment had, had been, even been entered, more rent had accrued, but we didn't, we didn't really re receive those monies. So this was just through the date of the hearing. Um, and, and, if, and if you adopt their position, you're going to get an absurd result. Uh, you're going to have a, a flood of cases, you know, one after another after another for every month or two months or three months that accrue. So, uh, I'm getting so, PTSD all over again. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to bring up Part 52, no. but um, as many of you Great know. Great times we're having. Oh, yeah, they were good Great times. times. Um, if there are no further <laughs> questions from the panel, I'll, I'll press my, my Thank time. you. Uh, so that one case, 71 AD second, 578, I just read it. It doesn't stand for the proposition that you're setting it for. It says, basically, you don't have the acceleration clause. You cannot ask for the rents that haven't come, that haven't come due yet. Uh, that's, so where, that's what it says. Your Honor, I'll, I'll, I'll add another case. Uh, and you want to do that? OK. Yeah, yes, I do, absolutely. Um, 78 AD, 3D, uh, 1035, uh, Rafula v. I'm sorry, 70 AD? 78 AD 3D right. 1035. Okay. Uh, and there, the uh, the the landlord um, actually appealed from a judgment um, made after an inquest, and the the second department expressly held that the only damages that could be recoverable in that instance were the uh, deficiency that accrued at the time that the complaint was filed. I'll also cite um, it's a federal decision. Um, above Net uh, Communications Inc. Uh, v. AD Data Corp. 2010 Westlaw. Uh, 235005, and I quote, as a general matter, New York courts New York courts have held that if the injured party seeks relief for the breach of contract calling for periodic payments over time, absent an acceleration provision, he may recover only those payments that the defendant had failed to make as of the time of the filing of the lawsuit. Thank you. You're welcome. People versus Adams. May it please the court, Clara Hammond Oakley on behalf of Mr. Adames. Counsel, assuming yes. that we agree with you that um, the burglary charge was not a registrable offense, uh, what happens to the supplemental sex offender victims fee? Yes, Your Honor. So I believe that that fee cannot be imposed in the case that Mr. Un under the crime that Mr. Adames was convicted of. Um, the supplemental sex offender victim fee in its name says that it only applies to sex offenders. Did he, did he plead guilty just to the 140.25 sub 2, or did he also plead guilty one to 130.91? He pled guilty to both of those, yes. He, and so then in 630.35 uh, 1B, does it not require a fee of that nature to be imposed on the what, for 130 offenses? It requires a fee to in, be imposed if somebody is convicted of an offense that is contained in Article 130. However, Mr. Adames was convicted of an offense that was in Article 140, burglary, that was enhanced by a, a section in Article 130. Uh, his, con, his crime of conviction was not contained in Article 130, and so therefore that supplemental sex offender fee by its own plain language does not apply to him. I would also add that it's a uh, standard practice, those supplemental sex offender fees, um, sex offender registration fees, those are applied when somebody is in fact certified as having to register under SORA, and if somebody is not certified as registering under SORA, those fees, the general practices, are not applied to them. They're sex offender fees. Mr. Adame says the ADA concedes, is not a sex offender. The ADA also concedes that he does not have to pay the um, sex offender registration fee, and for similar reasons, he doesn't have to pay that $1,000 fee. Oh, counsel, I'm looking at the transcript. Yes. Um, where the court is indicating that the defendant is pleading guilty to burglary in the second degree as a sexually motivated offense, 140.25 subdivision 2 and 190.91 subdivision 1. Yes. So. Yes, Your Honor. So he, he pled guilty. He had one conviction. That uh -huh. conviction was of committing burglary. Mm -hmm. That was the underlying offense. And he was accused, he, and he pled guilty to committing it as a sexually motivated felony. However, I believe that the use of the word contained in the statute indicates that the legislature, when they made that, which I would add was enacted prior to the sexually motivated felony uh, section even being added to the penal law, um, were envisioning people pleading guilty to 130 offenses, not people pleading guilty to some other part of the penal law uh, as a sexually motivated felony. 
Additionally, Your Honor, I would add that the, the other sections of the penal law, I believe it's 70.35 and 60.13 or something like that, show that the legislator knows that when you just say Article 130 offenses, that they don't, that doesn't naturally include sexually motivated felonies because in those sections, the legislature said including sexually motivated felonies. They did that in both of those sections. The legislature clearly knows how to make it obvious that they want to include these kind of strange crimes, this sort of like sexual enhancement um, in the purview of a section. They did not make any modification to the provision for the supplemental section. Doesn't that be. work in the opposite? If they wanted to include it, they would have? But otherwise, they, they left it broad. I mean, I don't think they left it broad, Your Honor. I think that they left it narrow, and they declined to add including sexually motivated felonies, which is obviously something that they know they have to clarify because they did that in other sections of the penal law. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Hunter Barron for the people. Uh, I do want to start on the fee. First is, um, I will note that this was completely unpreserved below. The defendant objected to his registration as a sex offender, but didn't object to this particular fee, which is not tied directly to sex offender registration. Well, I mean, I think that's the debatable question, right? Like, is it really right. tied or not? I mean, it is titled supplemental sex offender fee, which kind of would lead one to believe that it's somebody who's been convicted as a sex offender, therefore registrable. Yes, Your Honor. I would, I would say that the most important and controlling thing here is how the fee is defined, not how the fee is titled. And so notwithstanding that title, the fee does, the, the, the definition does say uh, contained in Article 130, which a sexually motivated felony is. But what about the distinction that your adversary makes that where in other areas of the, the um, penal law, they do specify including sexually motivated felonies when they're talking about specifically section 60.13 and 70. Point, I think it was 80 something. Yes, Your Honor. I think two responses to that. First is that the penal law is telling us exactly that Article 130 includes sexually motivated felonies. And the second thing is that, you know, I think that reads more clearly as a clarification. Um, if you were to take out that phrase, I don't think the legislature intended to say, oh, if we don't include this clarification, then a sexually motivated felony is not part of Article 130. I think contained in Article 130, it really speaks for itself, and, and that plain language supports that reading. And there's no doubt that this was contained in Article 130, right? Yes, so, yes, 130.91, mm -hmm. right. I think is the statute. 130.91, okay. Yes, that's right. right, Your Honor. Um, and I will also add additional to preservation that the defendant in this case did sign a waiver of appeal, and that would also uh, encompass this fee as well. So unless Your Honors have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first, regarding preservation, um, I do believe that this was preserved. My, the defense counsel objected to my client having to register as a sex offender. The judge ruled against her. If she had at that point said, Your Honor, I'd like to object to the sex offender fees being obsessed, the judge would have said, what, what are you doing? Why are you wasting my time? All of these things rise and fall together. If the judge, conversely, had agreed with defense counsel, he wouldn't have assessed these fees. So the, this was not an objection that needed to be made piecemeal, piecemeal. This was drawn to the attention of the judge, the issue of whether or not the client was a sex offender, whether or not the sex offender fees were appropriate. Additionally, Your Honors, if you do decide that um, it was not preserved, this court routinely reaches this kind of issue in the interest of justice. Um, this is an illegal fee that should not be allowed to stand. In addition, it's a very high illegal fee. My client is incarcerated. He has been incarcerated for a long time. He has been trying to pay off this fee. And even after six years, he hasn't been able to. This is a very large amount of money. Regarding the appeal waiver, um, the case cited by the prosecution in their brief, Morales, does seem to say that an appeal waiver would cover this claim. However, Morales is about the procedural legality of sentencing. It's not about the substantive legality. The case law is clear that a person can't waive a challenge to the substantive legality of sentencing. In Morales, the, the decision, the third department doesn't describe what, what went on below. However, it cites to a case by this court um, where the defendant was complaining that the sex offender fee, which was lawfully assessed, was not announced at sentencing. That sort of claim is clearly waived by a waiver of appeal. 
this kind of claim has never been found to be waived by a waiver of appeal, even a valid one, which was not in this case. Thank you.